Bismillah, alhamdulillah, you're watching Way of the Muslim, defining the Muslim character. And I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and for the next few minutes, I want to talk about something very important in developing character as a Muslim. And that's the subject of doing good deeds for the sake of Allah. Many times we hear about people talking in their faith, I believe, I believe. Many people say, I believe God is one. This is certainly an important part, definitely an aspect in Islam that's needed. But after the belief, what is there? And some people say, isn't my belief sufficient? I'd like to share with you now the importance of doing good deeds for the sake of the one you believe in, which is God Almighty, Allah. We have some hadiths here, teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that have been preserved for over 1,400 years. I think you'll enjoy these as much as I do. I'd like to share with you and the translation or interpretation to the English language. This is a story that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told, and it was narrated on the authority of Abdullah ibn Omar. May Allah be pleased with them. And he tells us the Prophet wasalam, said, Three people were traveling, and while they were traveling, they were overtaken by rain. So they took shelter inside of a cave that was in the side of a mountain. And while they were in the cave, the rain made this big rock fall down. And the rock fell over the entrance to the cave in such a way that they were unable to leave because the entrance was blocked. One of them said, let us think of some deeds Mu'amala, deeds that we have done for the sake of Allah. And let us ask Allah, based on our good deeds, to remove this obstruction from the entrance. So Allah could relieve us of this difficulty, any of us, anybody. And so one of them said, okay, O oh Allah, I had my parents who were very old, and I had small children. And for their sake, I used to work hard as a shepherd. One time when I returned home at night, I milked the sheep to give the milk to my parents as I always did. But because I'd gotten in so late that night, my parents were already sound asleep. Now, I stood there over their heads holding the milk, and I wanted to give it to my children who were crying, but I didn't really want to do this because my parents are asleep here. So, I stayed in this condition until they woke up. And I disliked to give the milk to these children before my parents, even though they were crying. In this state of mind, I consider that I did this only for the sake of Allah. So, Allah, if you accept this from me, then open this rock so that we can at least see the sky. Allah made it open. So they could see the sky. The second person said, Oh Allah, I had a cousin, a girl, who I loved so much as any man has passion for any woman. And I tried to seduce her, but she refused until I offered her money that she desperately needed. So I tried hard to collect the money to give to her. And then I went to her with that to try to have sex with her. But she said, if you're truly a servant of Allah, then fear Allah and don't do this to me, except in a legal way, she meant by having marriage. So I left her, O Allah, and if you consider that I had done this seeking only your pleasure, then please let the rock move a little to open this a little wider. And Allah made it happen. He shifted the rocks so that it was wider. And then the last person said, O Allah, I used to employ a person who worked for wages for me, equal to a small amount of rice. And when he finished his job, he wanted his wages. But when I presented it to him, he gave it up and refused to take it. Then I kept on taking this rice, planting it in the ground, then reaping the harvest over and over until there was enough money to buy the price of some cows and even to pay a shepherd. Later on, this man came back to me and he said, Give me what's due to me. And I said to him, Go and take these cows and the shepherd. So he took them and went away. And, O oh Allah, if you consider that I did this seeking your pleasure, then please remove the remaining part of the rock. And so Allah accepted from them 
and he moved the rock the rest of the way, removing their difficulty. This story had a big impact on me the first time that I heard it. And I was thinking, can you imagine that people could do good deeds for the sake of Allah and then ask Allah, Oh Allah, please accept something from me that I have done and then remove difficulties or obstructions from in my path, from in front of me. And when I learned that Islam is teaching that you have to have two things to make it really work, I was very pleased with this. The first is to have the correct belief. La ilaha illallah. There is none to wor worthy of our worship except only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God alone is worthy of all worship. And then immediately after though, we have to do what? We have to have amala. We have to have these deeds and we have to do them for the sake of Allah. Now some of the actions that we do, we do to kind of show off for other people. So these cannot be considered as something we did for Allah. But when we do something, especially things we did in secret, nobody knows what our intention was except the law. And we've mentioned this in several of our programs, talking about this beautiful hadith, this teaching of Muhammad that tells us about inma, amal of dunya. For sure that all the deeds are going to be judged according to the intentions. So if we keep our intention pure and then we do the deed for Allah, it's amazing how he makes things work out in our lives. Of course it requires us to have patience. And it requires for us to be sincere. And if we're sincere and working for the sake of Allah, then inshallah, God willing, he'll make these things work out for us. And when we ask him, and this is what I was talking about here, when we ask him based on not just our faith, but these good actions that we did for him, you'll be surprised. You'll be very surprised at what Allah will make happen in your life. So this is one of the things that we talk about when we talk about the development of the Muslim character. We ask our children, especially trying to encourage them, for the sake of Allah, do these good deeds. Even if the people are not, not appreciating what you do, you didn't do it for the people, you did it for Allah. And so this is something that I like to remind myself about. And also when I was talking in this particular one, you remember the story in the story when it talks about the man who milked the animals and then he had uh, a bowl or something to give it to his parents. But he stood there and waited for them to wake up. He waited all the way till the morning. And something here is important. You have to know that in Islam, the relationship between the child and the parents is really, really big. And it's your parents who have more rights even than your children do. Now, that may sound a little bit strange to some people in some countries, but you have to realize how important the family relationship is in Islam. And the parents definitely have the most rights over us. Here's another teaching of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. He said, whoever loves that he would be granted more wealth, means in this life, and have a longer life, then he should keep good relations with his closest relatives. I want to repeat that. And this is, by the way, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, peace be upon him, whoever loves that he be granted more wealth and that his life be prolonged, then he should keep good relations with his closest relatives. Of course, we know you should keep good relations with all your relatives, not just some of them and not just the closest ones. But the closest ones have the most rights on us. When we have a good relationship with our mothers, our fathers, our brothers, our sisters, our wives and husbands, and with our children, then all of this works together to make our life easier for us. But we shouldn't just do it for them. We shouldn't just do it to show off either. But what? So that we do it because we know that's what Allah wants us to do. Then these actions become something so valuable, not only on the Day of Judgment, Obviously, we want our rewards on the Day of Judgment, but we can even ask Allah based on these deeds here in this life. That's a valuable teaching. And while we're talking on this subject, you know, we're asking all the time for Allah's mercy. This is called Rahma in the Arabic language. And Allah's names are Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And Rahma is in these two words, Rahma. There's another word, though, that comes from this, Ar-Rahm. Ar-Rahm is a word in Arabic which actually means the womb of the mother. And listen to this beautiful teaching in Islam. This is amazing. It's on the authority of Abu Huraira. 
And he says, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah created all the creations. And when he finished from his creations, the Araham, the womb, meaning the motherhood, speaks to him and says, O oh Allah, at this place I seek refuge with you from those who cut the ties with me. So Allah says, Yes, won't you be pleased that I will keep good relations with the one who keeps good relations with you? And I will sever the relation with the one who severs relations with you? And the womb said, Yes. O oh, my Lord. And Allah said, Then that is for you. Then the Prophet, peace be upon him, added, Read in the Quran, if you like, the statement of Allah in Surah Muhammad, by the way, chapter 44, verse 22. And Allah says, Would you then, if you were given the authority, do mischief in the land and sever the ties of kinship? It's a rhetorical question. It implies immediately something amazing here. If Allah gave you authority in the land, would you go out and do mischief in the land? And then what he says after that is cutting the ties of kinship, which is considered by Allah some amazing and horrible kind of mischief that a person shouldn't do. This is something forbidden. It's haram in Islam to cut these ties, and it's something important to keep these ties. But particularly here, I again want to mention that what we do is got to be for the sake of Allah. Because we want to keep coming back and realizing that if I do it for Allah, it's something that I can use on the day of judgment as a good deed. That whenever I'm asked on the day of judgment, what did you do with the favors that Allah gave you? And if I have some good deeds like this, maybe inshallah it will outweigh the bad deeds. You know, we've mentioned in one of our other programs, whoever has an intention to do a good deed, then he has a full good deed. But whoever completes the deed and does it, he has the reward of ten. Ten. Now, how about that? So I want to do my best to keep my intentions pure for Allah and keep my relations good. Because with good relations, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you so much barakah, reward and blessings in this life. We want to take a break. And then we want to come back and continue this discussion on the way of the Muslim defining the Muslim character. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Alhamdulillah, we're back. You're watching Way of the Muslim, Defining the Muslim Character. We've been talking about the good deeds and the intention behind it, being something that a person can supplicate, make dua, based on these mu'amalat, these good deeds that they've accomplished. So, in keeping with that tone, I want to remind us a little bit about what we just talked about, that the relationship between us and our mothers is so important that the word for the womb, the one that bore you, here is something amazing, a raham. And it comes from the same root as Rahman, Allah's mercy, a rahim, most gracious. And with that in mind, you can see why it's important for us to give so much good treatment to our mothers. And of course, the father. And then the hadith, which we mentioned so many times, and I love to say it though, because I love my mother too, and I'm sure you do. But when the man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, after Allah and his messenger, who then has the most rights on me? You know what he said? Your mother. He said, and then who? He said, your mother. He said, and then? And he said, then your mother and then your father. So this is uh, really amazing, showing us this relationship between the child and the mother. Now this came 1,400 years ago, by the way. Long before anybody ever heard about something called Mother's Day. <laughs> because for the Muslim, every day is Mother's Day. And we should keep this good relationship for the sake of Allah, 
regardless of how your mother treats you, you must give her the good treatment in Islam. Now, here's another one, and I'd like to share this hadith or teaching of Muhammad with you. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Allah has forbidden you, and this is haram, this is forbidden, that you be undutiful to your mothers. So therefore you have to obey them and honor them and respect them. Also, he's forbidding us to withhold when we should be giving. Also, he forbids us to demand something that's really not our right to demand. And also, he forbids you to bury your daughters alive. I have to explain that one because maybe you didn't know this, but when the Quran came 1,400 years ago, women had no rights whatsoever. It was really horrible. And it was the Quran that freed the women, and especially the young baby girls. Because what used to happen is the man would be so upset if a girl was born to him that he would take her out into the desert and bury her in the sand. And this was something horrible, but they used to do that. And the Prophet ﷺ forbid it, and Allah forbid it in the Quran. So I'll continue. And Allah has disliked that you talk too much about other people, and dislikes that you ask too many questions regarding the deen or the way of Islam. And finally, he dislikes that you waste your property. I want to mention something here, the difference between two things. The first thing is something forbidden. This is called haram, totally forbidden. If a person commits an action which is haram or forbidden, they can be punished by Allah in this life, in the grave, on the day of judgment, and in the next life. So they should be very careful about this subject of breaking these commandments of Allah. But the next category is something which is called makhru. Something which is very disliked by Allah. Allah hates it. You shouldn't do it. But if a person commits it, maybe he will punish them, but maybe not. So let's mention it again. I want you to hear the hadith again, keeping in mind the difference between this while I read these. The haram had four things, and the makru, or the disliked by Allah, had three. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Allah forbids you that you be undutiful to your mothers, that you treat them badly. And he forbids you to withhold what you should be giving. And he forbids you to demand the things you don't deserve. And he forbids you to bury your daughters alive. And Allah dislikes that you talk too much about others. He dislikes you ask too many questions. And he dislikes that you waste your property. We've been talking right along about the treatment of the mothers. And certainly we understand that. What about withholding what you should give? There are rights that are incumbent on all of us as Muslims from all the people. You, Of course you know your parents have rights. We've said that too many times. And then the people around you. But did you know that every single person has rights? Even the non-Muslims have rights in the Muslim community. And when the person is hungry, they have the right to be fed. And you don't have the right to withhold. You must feed those who are poor and indigent. And a person starving and has nowhere to go, you don't have the right to withhold from them. You must share with them. And then we talk about demanding things. A lot of times people say, well, this is, I want this. This is mine. Give it to me because I'm bigger and tougher and stronger than you. No, that's not right. And we mustn't demand from other people something that's really not our right. And to talk about burying our daughters alive, you might say, well, what is that relevant to today? Did you know that in Islam, abortion is something that's very wrong? When a woman is having a baby in her, to have an abortion is really, this is a bad thing. I wanted to mention that also when we talk about the things that Allah dislikes, this idea of talking about people too much, this doesn't just mean talking bad, which is totally forbidden. This is called haram. But even talking about them when it's something good, if you talk about them too much, there could be some problems. You might say, well, what? Well, for one thing, if you keep talking about people, you begin to eulogize them and make them more than what they really are. Or else you begin to put them in a lower state and cut them down. And either way, this is not right in Islam. If you need to say something about somebody, 
then you say that and let that be it. And when we talk about asking too many questions about the dean, I want to be sure you understand something. If you have a legitimate question, you need to ask it. We need to have answers. Islam encourages us, actually orders us to get knowledge about Islam. This is something very important for us to do. But sometimes people get the answer they need, but then they want to continue and say, why? And then you give the next answer, okay, why? And the next answer, why? And so, and so, and so. Just for the fun of ans uh, getting questions answered. And this is not right in Islam. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes. And then the Prophet ﷺ said also about the wasting of property. You stop and think about this 1,400 years ago that Islam is taking into consideration something that people in the West are only now really talking about, and that's this horrible waste. We have a waste, of course, of time, but here we're talking about now the waste of property. And this is something Muslims should be very careful about, even not to waste water. When we make wudu, we should be very careful in how we use water because all of the things that Allah gives us are considered a mana or a trust. So we shouldn't take it lightly. Let's continue and mention also something else that the Prophet ﷺ talked about, the mother. And this is in the case of Asma bin Abu Bakr. This is the sister of the Prophet's wife, Aisha radiallahu anhu. May Allah accept from them and have mercy on them and be pleased with them. It says, she said that my mother came to me and wanted a favor from me during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So I asked the Prophet, may I treat her kindly? And he replied, yes. Then Allah revealed a verse in the Quran. Allah does not forbid you with regard to those who did not fight against you because of your religion and did not drive you out of your homes, that you should show them kindness and deal justly with them. This is in Surah 60, verse 8. Let me recite that for you again and let you hear this. She comes to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and she's saying, you know, my mother came to me hoping that I would do some kind of favor for her during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So I went to the Prophet, and I asked, can I treat her kindly? And he said, yes. And that's when Allah revealed this verse in Surah 60, verse 8 of the Quran. Allah doesn't forbid you regarding those who didn't fight against you because of your way in Islam and didn't drive you out of your homes, that you show them kindness, deal with them justly. What a beautiful statement. Because, by the way, we have a lot of people coming into Islam these days. Islam is still the fastest growing religion in the world, despite all the things that are happening. So how should those new people who come into Islam view or look at their parents who are not Muslim, especially those who are treating them pretty bad, and yet they come to me and they want something from me, should I give it to them? Should I treat them kindly? And now the Prophet says, yes, peace be upon him, and Allah confirms it in the Quran. As long as they are not fighting you against your religion, and as long as they didn't drive you out of your homes, then you have a responsibility in kindness. Look at this, the humility in Islam, and this gentleness that needs to be with that, and of course, in justice, to treat them fairly. If people see the real way of the Muslim, do you realize that this could change their hearts? Have you thought about that? If I act on the things that I'm teaching here, and these things are affecting my life, can't the people realize, see that, hey, this guy is acting different. He's kind. He's generous. He's honest. He's speaking the truth. He's quiet. He doesn't shout and carry on and act silly. He doesn't argue and try to demand things that are not his. All the things that we've been talking about in our programs. If I do this, and I have this kind of change of character, shouldn't the people notice that? Shouldn't they say, hmm, what is it about you that's different? And it's happened to me. I'm not going to tell you the kind of person I was before I came to Islam. Some people said I wasn't that bad. <laughs> Allah knows best. But I know this. Since I've been in Islam, many people who would come to me and say, you're not the same person you used to be. You're really different. My closest relatives, my distant relatives, and those people that I used to do business with, they said, you're just not the same. We don't see you the same way. You've changed, and it's a change for the better. And this is coming from people who, by the way, 
they're not interested in Islam. They didn't want to be a Muslim until they see this difference. And I'm not the only one experiencing this. Many people coming into Islam and working on their character and working toward this idea of bringing out what Islam is teaching us to bring out through these characteristics, these changes, these things that we're talking about here will have an impact, not just on you, but those around you. And when people see this, inshallah, God willing, you'll see a difference in your life, perhaps even in their lives. But most important, as we say over and over and over, it has to be that we do it for Allah. Because when we do these things for Allah, as we mentioned in the beginning of the program, we can raise our hands and ask, Allah, based on these things that I'm doing, if you accept I did it for you, then please help remove the difficulties from my life. Now you're watching the way of the Muslim, defining the Muslim character. I hope you'll watch for other shows like this, and inshallah, we'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.